Section 6 of The Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker. The Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 3. In the Shadows of Race, Chapter 10. By J. Hampton Bishop. Chapter 10. In the Mounting Flames. Darkness came suddenly. A great splash of shifting night. Cloud merged into a murky, bell-like shadow which enfolded the universe and shut out the rosy flush which precedes the dusk. The breezes had disappeared, and the air was heavy with the sultry, enervating consistency of a tropic night. Through the density of the night, and very near him, a dark, weazen face cleft the shadows, and following it, the stealthy body of old Alibi. With finger to lip, she squatted to his level. Then she spoke. Eluko, the goddess of fire. It is that she mates with your brother, the son of the white moon god, and to please the great father a sacrifice is to be made, one that is, what you say, big, of a bigness for she, the daughter of the sun. Whiting sprang to his feet. Mac? Where did they find him? But Alibi was wondrously agile. She too was on her feet, clutching his arm with her claw-like hand. Fool! she hissed under her breath. Listen, tonight it is that you shall be that sacrifice— that so big sacrifice that even the sun father will be so pleased that he will smile on the son of the white moon god who mates with his daughter whiting grew suddenly weak a faintness groped with searching fingers along the avenues of his reason he staggered a step toward her what's that what do you mean alibi's eyes flashed and burned i am cursed of the great spirit already because that i have in my love for you told you his secrets and now it is that he would have you for a sacrifice and i warn you go quickly whiting wiped his face and tried a short laugh as he looked at her love him he just couldn't believe it besides the old fool might be lying the thing was preposterous if true where was mac he harked back to his first question where did they find mclaughlin and where is barza the fiendish smile which Alibi showed him was the finished product of savage hatred. She raised her arms and lowered them impressively, as if that explained everything. Then, Barza! She ran, but, yes, quickly, through the big trees around the swamp, and your brother was of great heaviness, so that she fell and rolled into the deep swamp water. The big jaws of the water god found her, found her quick, and colored the swamp water red, a most beautiful red, so that, and McLaughlin, for God's sake! But McLaughlin's own voice answered him, filled with a rising anger as he addressed someone out there in the darkness. Keep your damned animals back, he cried harshly. I'll kill the first one that touches Dunk. Allaby smothered a purely feminine little shriek. You would die then, or is it to come with me? She dragged on his arm. Quick, they smell you even now. It is that I fool them. From her girdle she snatched a folded bit of soft bark. Quickly she opened it and took out a handful of a white powder, sprinkling it upon the ground. The odor arising from it was Eluko's own odor, only now so strong that it arose in sickening intense draughts, almost stifling. She pushed him before her with compelling force and sifted the powder as they walked. Back there McLaughlin was arguing, threatening, pleading in turns, and his words were plain to Whiting. What might those devils do to him if left alone? He wouldn't desert and leave him there. He wouldn't. He jerked loose from the old woman and started back on the run. His gun was in his quarters, if he could just reach it. But he couldn't. McLaughlin was standing with his back to the door, attired only in the torn and ragged sleeping garments of the night before, and was facing them, empty-handed, with only the superior power of a stronger will over that of a lower. Before him stood Iluko, proud, imperious, with flashing eyes at the unwanted temerity disputing her desires. At her feet crouched the taut, tense body of her leopard cat, while behind her, crowding closer every moment, were her slaves and gorillas. To them, McLaughlin was a menace, a foolish obstacle, who dared to thwart the power of their sovereign queen, and should be dealt with accordingly. Whiting stepped into the circle of light from their glowing firebrands, and almost precipitated a headlong rush. He stepped quickly to the side of McLaughlin with nearly an air of bravado, and for a moment McLaughlin lost his wonderful self-possession. "'Dunk, for God's sake,' he panted. "'Get out quick. These crazy beasts would kill you. I may not be able to hold them off.' Whiting never would forget that moment so long as life should last. Wide stretches of inky blackness, with a circle of 
nodding fire points breaking through, and beneath them in the flickering gusts of their yellow light, faces. Faces shiny black with gleaming whites of eyes and rows of glistening teeth, faces each set in its frame of shaggy dark hair, animal faces, yet dreadfully human in their awful significance. And last, the face, savage, brutal, but withal beautiful, with a wild, predominant beauty that was completely beyond all understanding. He turned to McLaughlin with a dazed, helpless look. The shock of the thing had dulled the terror of it. "'We'll see it through together, Mac,' he said softly. "'And if this is the end, man, I'm game.' McLaughlin turned on Aluko, and his words came sharp as the sudden thrust of a well-sent rapier. "'Back! Back with them, or I, too, shall die!' At his words a sudden, inexplicable change came over Aluko. Gone were the proud haughtiness and the disdainful flash of eye. She looked at McLaughlin, and her face melted into a soft, enticing smile, as alluring as the wiles of a feminine Satan. She stepped close to him, looked him squarely in the eye. McLaughlin stood as if turned to stone, completely under the spell. Then he leaped away from her, his face a ghastly white. "'Woman, what would you?' he screamed. She stood facing him. When she spoke, her voice was low and tense. "'You mate with the goddess of fire tonight, and there must be a sacrifice, a great sacrifice that my father would smile on me. Would you then anger him, and for such as he?' She turned to Dakona, who stood in front of the crouching gorillas. She motioned him back and stood authoritatively. "'Begone with them to the scene of the sacrifice. We follow at once.' And as Dakona turned to obey, she cautioned him quietly, "'Close guard, and see to it that you are in place when I arrive.' Then, as they were swallowed up in the darkness, she addressed one word to the slaves, and the next instant Whiting and McLaughlin were the center of a lunging, struggling mass of straining bodies and flying legs and arms. Whiting felled the nearest one and leaped upon the prostrate body as he used his fists on the next one. His arms became terrible flails, on the ends of which were balls of fists that seemed to be more than accurate in their efficiency. But he was close-pressed. Within the moment he knew the unequal struggle could have but one ending, and that very uncomfortable for himself. He would make it as difficult as possible. With a sudden low crouch he lunged sidewise with terrific force, knocking the legs from under the natives he struck. Then with an upward bounding motion he cleared the bunch of them and landed on his feet beyond their reach. From the tail of his eye as he leaped he saw McLaughlin go down under a bevy of black bodies, and heard Eluko scream a command that he be not hurt. With this injunction he ran. How he ran! No such solicitous behest could possibly be expected for himself. Therefore he ran with a complete abandonment, a wild headlong passion of flight leading anywhere, and inspired by the quite primitive instinct that speaks only of self. The fear of the hunted came over him and conquered, conquered his self-possession and his will, and left him a flying fugitive, devoid of destination or of purpose. In the heavy darkness and after what seemed hours he came up suddenly with frightful force against the solid trunk of a tree. The impact sent him sprawling where he lay, his breath coming in wheezing gasps, and the pounding of his heart jarring his whole body. He did not attempt to rise, but lay quite still, enduring the pain of reaction, and gradually a semblance of self-possession returned to him. He reviewed his recent encounter, and realized utterly the futility of his flight. Even now, he didn't have the remotest idea as to any direction, and even so, any one he would choose was fraught with dangers, grave dangers, beyond any conception. He turned presently with a tired motion, and rested his cheek against the cool face of the earth, closing his eyes. Of what use to go farther or longer rebel? There could be but one ultimate result, regardless of what he might do, and the thought of that result and what it might surely portend for himself, no longer held the power of affecting him one way or the other. He nestled his body closer to the earth, and smiled whimsically as he knew this. A blissful feeling of quietude and repose stole over him, lulled him, and offered with treacherous mien a lethargy for which his tired body was yearning. His complete acquiescence toward this desire he knew to be a weakness, even as he complied with it, yet... Desolation and terror fail of their purpose when once they have overreached themselves, and such now was the case. It was as though a misty, intangible curtain was hung before all from which he had been fleeing, and enclosed him in a peaceful, blissful spot, in which only was found such memories as could but strengthen his overwhelming desire for peace. 
He laughed softly and stretched his body out to its full length in a perfect abandonment of luxury. The earth was a downy cushion, and her lap the cradle of the gods. He gad, who could find fault with such a couch? But even then his fate was upon him. In fact, had borne him straight into the path of Aluko and her savage knights, where, in his state of semi-coma, it but remained for them to fall upon him suddenly and completely overpower him. As he was jerked to a standing posture, he saw far in the rear McLaughlin, white of face and haggard-eyed, being urged along an unwilling guest to the gruesome festivities whose import was the illogical effect of his own greatness and honor. To Whiting this suddenly appeared the climax of all ludicrous situations, and he laughed aloud, a boyish, ringing laugh which stung McLaughlin into a perfect frenzy of action. With what seemed one bound, he reached Whiting's side. His lips were drawn thin, and were the color of ancient parchment. When he spoke, his voice was thin and dry and cracked, as that of the very old. He had lived a life within a day, and it was almost more than he could bear. Donk, donk, what have I done to you? he cried pitifully. A change came over Whiting. Under the light of the glowing torches he stood erect, a figure of virile manhood defying the world, and than which nature has offered nothing more wonderful. In his glance shone a sublime courage, a perfect mastership, and a compassionate understanding of much that was very difficult to understand. He was on the borderland of the unknown, and its reflection was the creation of a wonderful patience and a forbearance of his friend that was more than human. "'Your hand, Mac, old boy,' he said softly. "'And I'm your friend, you know that. Friend Mac, you understand, and that's all that matters.' McLaughlin grasped the outstretched hand and turned his head away. He tried to speak, but no words came, and the muscles of his face twitched pitifully. Whiting put a hand upon his shoulder. "'Buck up, buck up, old man. Get a keen edge on that wit of yours. Who knows?' But things were hopeless, indeed. The slaves were close-pressed around them, not to be again so easily deceived, and, as if by common impulse, urged the party forward. Iluko took the lead, very indignant and haughty, and attended closely by the great spotted leopard cat. At a bend in the path, Dakona stood before them, expectant, arrogant, while in the uneven light the dark figures of the hairy men were seen in a squatting semicircle around a carefully piled heap of bamboo and dry brush at the base of a much charred tree. From behind and quite suddenly came a long drawn falsetto wail with its terminating whoop, and on the instant another, and another, until the air was rent with the savage screams and the terrific pound of the native drum. Torches bobbed their points of light in time to the swaying bodies, who twisted and turned and writhed this way and that, and back again within the circle made ready for them. But a long moment Whiting stood and looked on impersonally with a peculiar, detached air, as if the proceedings were something apart from anything in which he might be at all interested— and in that moment old Alibi stepped from the outer shadows directly in front of Aluko with a poised spear above her head. For a fraction of a second it hung there, deadly and menacing, while the face below it twitched and jerked and showed no slightest hint of reason. Then, dexterously, with a cunning movement, the glistening point flashed downward, but a long, sinuous body, gorgeously coated, met the arm that held it, and Alibi fell with the flesh lacerated and torn away until her naked heart lay quivering beneath the great claw of the panther cat. Whiting waited to see no more. With a lightning movement he snatched the nearest spear and ran it through the slave who held it, and treated the next nearest in the same manner. With incredible swiftness he dashed here and there, dealing death, or worse, at every blow. Many of the slaves dropped their torches in abject bewilderment, or to attack him, and one of the burning brands fell upon the awaiting beer. The flame shot up through the dry tinder and lighted the world. Every bush and twig stood out, apart, in the fierce glow from the mounting flames. Whiting felt an exultant, fierce joy at this, at the frustration of their plans, if only for a little while, and he redoubled his energies. With each thrust of the deadly point and its withdrawal he experienced a sensation wholly beyond his comprehension. It was sweet with the primal lust for blood, to kill and kill and kill. He became a live hurricane of fury, hurling himself upon them time and again with movements so inconceivably rapid as to make a repulse next to impossible and through it all he somehow saw and heard everything. He saw Iluko with one flat-footed spring land on a wide, overhanging limb, where she stood erect, with the panther crouched at her feet, watching the conflict. He saw the light of the dancing flames shine fully upon the gleaming white of her skin, and throw her body in a bold relief, and he heard her scream to Dakona to protect McLaughlin. 
He saw the repulsive beastmen rise erect and drum with hairy fists upon their great chests. He heard them roar and scream, as once before he had heard them, and he saw their beast faces with protruding jaws and yellow fangs snarling a challenge to all before them. He saw McLaughlin, snatched up in the powerful arms of one of them, as if he were an infant, and borne away in the darkness. And before him he saw the powerful figure of Dakona himself, equipped for a horrible conflict. His eye appraised the native, as he gathered his forces for what he knew to be his last stand. Took him into the last detail, and quite unconsciously paid him tribute. He was in his entirety the dominant force of brute, brute with all the primordial propensities of the brute creation, and by right of this force was demanding subservience from a thing less obviously fortunate. Whiting breathed deeply, and his teeth went together with a click. Every muscle in his body knotted in preparation for a final plunge. A second he stood so, a slim boyish figure courageous and unafraid, the center of a scene more weird than any fabled horror of history. Then came a chorus of barking rifles, the whine of leaden bullets, and an exultant scream of triumph wrenched the word climax from the situation and added another chapter. In the bedlam which followed, Whiting saw vaguely the face of Uema, the faces of the different porters from the deserted camp, and the blue gleam of rifle barrels. Then for a moment the shrill scream of Aluko rose above the tumult as she stood straight and haughty, a savage sovereign of a more savage tribe, and he raised his eyes to her. He saw her suddenly stoop and clasp the leopard's head between her hands, and that powerful beast quivered from head to foot. The next instant his body flashed downward, and the struggle that had been only a battle became a raging hell from which there was no escaping. He would reach a porter and get a gun in his hand, with a gun now before him was... Again Dakona, flanked on either side by a snarling ape. He stooped to dodge, but a long hairy arm met him and he shot backward. In midair something struck his head. A blinding flash of piercing lightning shot him through and through, and he fell and fell and fell into a soft oblivion. End of section 6 In the Shadows of Race, chapter 10